so without further ado, I'm going to hand it over to Steve. So Steve Wexler, we're super excited he's back for a full-fledged presentation this time instead of just a teaser that got us uh, super excited about this meeting. Uh, so he's going to present some tips and tri tricks, so I'm really excited to see, um, really excited to learn some new things tonight. Um, <clears throat> as we know, uh, Steve is the author of the one of the authors of the big book of dashboards. So we were just talking about the poster you'll see when he presents in his uh, background there of the, of um, his, of the big, yeah, exactly. <laughs> of the big book of dashboards. He's a five time uh, Tableau Zen master. He's an iron viz champion. So very prestigious. Um, he has a great understanding of Tableau and, uh, and an ability to explain it to the rest of us. So uh, looking forward to his presentations in addition uh, if you like what you see tonight, he has a workshop in July, so you can sign, and those, of course, everything's online, so it's a great opportunity to be able to uh, learn from the best. So take it away when you're ready, Steve. Thank you so much, and I get to do these presentations here and workshops literally in my bunny slippers. Thank you. <laughs> awesome. It's a Father's Day gift a couple of day, uh, years ago. Uh, in any case, let me share my screen. Thank you so much for having me, and thank you all for joining in these. I didn't think it could get any stranger or more traumatic, and somebody up the ante, especially in the United States. In any case, thanks for being here with me and for the opportunity. So I want to share some tips, tricks, and techniques. Um, uh, thank you for the introduction. Uh, this Tableau Zen Master thing, I joke about it because I put it on my card and I'm, I'm proud of, of this achievement. And if you're in the Tableau community, you know this is an actual thing. If you're not in the Tableau community and I hand you a card that says Tableau Zen Master, you think, God, this guy's a tool. What guy puts that on his own business card? Jeez. And, oh, wouldn't it be great to actually be in a position where we're handing each other physical business cards? Um, I'm certainly proud of that uh, accomplishment, but in, in data visualization, the thing I'm most proud of is having had the good sense to recruit Jeff Schaefer and Andy Cotgrave and to be one of the three authors of the big book of dashboards. In any case, um, here's what I have in mind uh, to show you today. Uh, fun with discrete measures, whatever that means. Uh, copying and pasting formatting, which has been a feature that's been in the product for years and most people don't know about it. Pasting data, uh, you can just copy and paste from a Word document or a website. And then these things. Um, um, I love these showing the gap. This is showing the gap between Democrats and Republicans um, and how Pew Research does it so effectively. Um, well, how do you make something like that uh, in Tableau. And, and what I have on the right, by the way, is this was originally a population pyramid, and I think they stink. Um, and I think a much better way to do it, well, how do you make something like that? Then there's something related to it, and I did show it back in March, but I think it's so useful, I'll show it again. Um, it came as an alternative to this, which is, how do I show this period versus the previous period? And show, you know, the gaps between now and the previous period, and the, and the bar is how we're doing now, and the vertical line is how we did the last period. And the, and the red dot, which is hard not to see, that just means that the change from the previous period was statistically significant. And that's how we said, hey, here's a pretty good way to do it, and this is how it is in the big book of dashboards. We also said, you could also do it like this. Well, since then, I've thought, you know, I don't think I'd do it like this. I think I would do it like this. And a bunch of my workshop attendees said, nah, they were having trouble seeing, wait, the blue is now and the gray is the previous period. It was easier for them to do the comparison. And I said, really? And I thought about it and it said, so you want to see where you started and where you ended up. And it led to, how about this? And this is a comet chart. So the tail is the previous period and the head is the current period. Turns out it's really easy to make these things. All right, if time permits, and I think it will, um, I also want to show you a marginal histogram. That's just a scatter plot, and it's showing, let me show you what we've got here. We've got age and salary distribution. This is salary, and this is age. 
and this is unfortunately really accurate in terms of what the salary curve looks like. Um, you reach a you know, middle age, 50, 55, and that's kind of your peak earning years. And afterwards, you kind of decline. And I won't give away too much, but I'm kind of in the decline period. In any case, yeah, this is kind of giving me a good sense, but maybe I'm the, the manager of a, you know, HR manager of a company. And I want to get a sense of, well, how many employees fall into which different buckets? And if you put the marginal histogram around this thing, oh, I can see most of my employees are between 40 and 50, and 50 and 60, and I can see how my salaries are distributed over a year. Wow, that's, that's useful. And so anytime I see a scatter pot, I wonder, is this a candidate to add a marginal histogram? Same with any time I see a, um, um, a highlight table. Highlight table is just a heat map with the numbers in it. Um, let me explain what I have here. Um, I've got the day of the week up here, and I have the hour of the day over here. And you can see there are certain pockets, you know, where the color is dark, like the 333 over here, and maybe the 220 over here, et cetera. If you're wondering, well, just what is this thing that's showing hour of the day and day of the week? This is the propensity of a certain politician who will remain nameless to tweet. The fact that I'm using an orange color palette is completely coincidental. Um, in any case, um, Suppose I wanted to answer the question, on what day does this politician tweet the most? What day does he tweet the least? What hour of the day does he tweet the most or the least? Well, I can add a marginal histogram to this thing and it works great. Um, if time permits, um, I want to show you how to do um, a jitter plot. Um, I'm a big believer in showing disaggregated data. This is a really good example of it. Imagine you have some sort of system where you can type in your ID and, and just see how does my salary compare to other employees in this industry, in my company, et cetera. And you use this thing and the gray bars are everybody else and the orange dot, that's you. You are respondent 1016. And you look at this thing and go, well, wait, you know, my, you know, I thought my salary is pretty good, 82,000 American, and, and, and this is the average of everybody else is 112,000 or something like that. And my guess is you're a little bit miffed. Well, let me show you exactly the same data, and I think you're going to be downright incensed. Here's exactly the same data, and we'd look at Jenner. Wait a minute, my dot's really near the top over here. How can it possibly be so low over here? Exactly same data. Look, 82,000, 82,000, what's going on? Well, this was the average of everybody. So what have I got going on here? I'm showing the upper quartile, the median, and the lower quartile. And this is you with respect to everybody else within of, of a similar age. And the jittering, and if we don't get to it, you can just go to my website and type jittering. It's a wonderful technique. Instead of all the dots being in a strip, you can just move them left and right. Uh, in any case, let's start with some of the first stuff that we were, uh, wanted to look at, which is fun with discrete measures. So I'm gonna go back to our tried and true uh, superstore sales. I'm using 2020.1, so we're still seeing dimensions and measures. We're not seeing, you know, the slightly different way of presenting um, the fields that you have available to you. And I'll put subcategory over here and, um, and I will put sales over here. Sorry, I meant to do this the other way around. There we go sort this in descending order. And uh, I'm doing control left arrow and control right arrow on this just to change the size of the chart. And, um, you know, I, I wanna have the actual numbers here, so I'll put that on label. Well, you know, I also wanna have, let me do a quick table calculation and say, um, well, I've got it over here. You know, I'd also like to have percent of total on here. So percent of total, you know, I think my apologies, there, you know, there are probably some people, wait a minute, how did you get that? You can just do quick table calculation and say percent of total. 
control drag that onto label so it's in both places. So now I have the percentage. And I just name that, that field. So in any case, I want to have both of these things on here. I want to see the percentage and I want to see the numbers. And if you're looking at it and going, why are we only seeing a couple of these things? Well, that's because if I click label, um, I can see it's not allowing the labels to overlap, which is actually a pretty good thing because if I allow the labels to overlap, it kind of looks like a mess. So, well, how can I fix this? Well, I could click the label button. This is, they do a marvelous job with the marks card. This one is not so intuitive, finding this puppy over here. Brings up this dialog box. And instead of these things being on two lines, I'll put them on the same line. So the sum of sales and the percentage of total sales. Apply it and I don't know, this is kind of a, it's kind of messy. That's very cluttered looking. So how can I make this not so cluttered? Well, let me try this. And also let me go to label and yeah, we're good. Let me take sales and put it right here. Yuck, what did it do? It's trying to create a scatter plot because it sees a measure over here and it sees a measure over here. So let me change this to discrete. Ooh. So I just right click this and said, make it discrete. And let me do the same thing with the percent as well. Right click it, make it discrete. And now I've got my numbers, as uh, uh, actual amounts, percentage of total, and I have these really nice looking clean bars. By the way, we could, um, um, uh, you know, other things you can do. I can now put subcategory on label, change the label to be, oh, let me make it left align. Is that gonna work? No, I gotta do it here. Left align and possibly not show the header. Anything that surrounds a chart is called the header, even though this is on the left side. And don't know if you like that look to it or not, but let me go back to this. So that's an example of, um, changing something that's normally a green pill, continuous, anytime it's continuous, Tableau wants to draw an axis, meaning numbers that go from low to high, and instead chain overriding the default and making it discrete. All right, let me show you another useful technique um, that I use all the time, not that it's terribly complicated, nor is just changing the green thing into a blue thing or the blue thing into a green thing. Um, and let, let me play with the formatting of this thing. Let me show you the format I kind of like for this, which is, let's do this. Uh, let me go to borders. The fact that borders and lines are two different things here kind of drive me nuts. Uh, I don't want any row dividers. I don't want any column dividers. Um, and I do, I'm not even sure, hold on. All right anything along the bottom here, which means I don't need on columns to have uh, grid lines. And I would like there to be um, a strong axis ruler over here. So I'm gonna go on, not on borders, but on lines. I'm gonna go to rows, axis ruler, and you know, make it a little thicker so you can really see it over here. And I tend to be a blue is good, gray, uh, blue is good, orange is bad type of person. And I, I, this is neither good nor bad. So I'm just going to make it neutral and make these bars gray. All right. I just spent a few minutes getting the formatting to be just so. Hey, I really like the way this thing looks. I like this kind of access ruler over here, the gray bars, etc. I want to do that on this. This looks like crap. By the way, this is what my early work looked like, you know, kind of these thick rules and stuff like that. And it did look like crap. Um, I don't want to go through that again. Well, it turns out I can right click 
on this tab, go to copy formatting, go to this tab, right click and say paste formatting. Hey, there you go. So hopefully there's, there's a, uh, hold on, you know, if that was, let me go to the attendees and I don't know if you have your little buttons down at the bottom and you can give me a, uh, oh, it doesn't look like you do. So can't give me a feedback on it. But um, if there's a way to go, hey, I didn't know that and that's useful, I'm delighted. All right, so those are um, uh, two tips and tricks. The other that so many people don't know about is this one. Let me find the document, copy and paste. So. You got some high fives on that, Steve. Okay, thank you. <laughs> thank you, appreciate, appreciate it. <laughs> This is one of those times where, you know, I'm, I'm speaking to um, I'm, uh, the, the, oh, hey, Steve, we haven't heard you for the last 10 minutes, that type of thing. Um, um, hey, I want to visualize this data. Um, it's in a Word document. Maybe it's up on a website. Yeah, I'm looking at a web page right now, and there's a table right there, and I'm dying to see, well, what's going on with this? So imagine this is a web page. You can just copy this. I'm, you know, right click and copying this. Go into Tableau, go to data and say, paste. And let's check out what's gonna happen. The clipboard, this one time shot clipboard is, is a data source. And so now, it, you know, I can just copy and paste and use this as a data source and I can visualize this. And if you're wondering, well, why does this say zero and zero? It's just, it just didn't quite get the formatting right. If I change, right click this, go to default properties, number format, I can send, change this to a percentage and I'll make it one decimal place and bingo. So by default, when you paste data, it wants to build this cross tab for you, but I can go ahead and create a totally different view of it. So that is um, uh, really useful if, oh, I found some data, I quickly want to visualize it, I don't want to put it in Excel, I don't want to have a scraper. Um, um, and uh, somebody just typed in, yeah, I can, you know, select multiple fields that I want, right click and change the default properties of all of them at the same time. So. Um, next item is making that gap chart. Um, so I've got some, you know, the, the thing that I showed you, the Pew Research or the difference between men and women um, on stuff. So let me do this. I've got um, that salary data and I've binned it. I created, you know, bins that were um, every 10 years. So I'll put my age bin up here. So people between 20 and 30, 30 and 40, et cetera. And I want to get the, what is the average salary for these people? And I want to do it by gender. So I'm just putting color on gender. And well, this is not what I'm looking for because it is stacking the marks. So it's taking all the men plus the women and adding it together. Um, the, uh, what I'm going to do in this case is I'm going to create a circle chart by default um, circle charts, you don't stack the marks, but bar charts, you do stack the items. And let me change the size of this so it looks like this. Um, and I guess the colors are fine with this. Well, what I want to do is draw that line um, in between. So I'm going to duplicate this. I've got two charts that are the same, but this is how you make a, by the way, it is called the connected dot plot is the official name of this chart. It is also called a gap chart, a barbell chart, or a dumbbell chart. And uh, I am happy to share the question that's coming in is uh, uh, pretty much, I can't share the slides, not that the slides are interesting, but the, uh, the workbook and all the examples that I'm citing are all down, I'll make all, are either already downloadable or I will make them downloadable. In any case, I've got this, I've now got the dupli duplicate items. I've got two charts, the circle chart, and I click here in the circle chart. I wanna make the second one a line chart. 
yikes, what's it doing? Well, it thinks that's the way I want to connect the line. What I'm going to do is I'm going to drag gender and put it on path. You, Tableau is guessing how I want to, to draw the points together. And what I want to do is draw a line between the men and the women. So I can see where the big gaps are. Oh, this is starting to look interesting. Now, what I'm going to do in this case is instead of having two separate charts, is I'm going to make this a dual axes chart. I've got the axes here and the axes here. Let me synchronize them, which I did by right clicking and saying synchronize the axes. And let me move these marks to the back. And let me do this. Let me make sure I'm in this. Here, here I've got the first chart, which is the circle. And here I've got the second chart. I always do it by just clicking here. And I want to make the size of the, the, the line a little bit bigger, maybe a lot a bit bigger. And, you know, make it a much lighter gray. And, and I've got an axis on the left, and now I have an axis on the right. Don't need that. So I am going to say, don't show the header. The thing on the right is called the header. The thing along the bottom of the chart is called the header. The thing all along the left side is called the header. The thing at the top of the chart is also called the header, but the, it's a bad and confusing nomenclature. Um, one last little um, cool uh, tidbit that I think you might like is, if, let's say I want to show the labels. Oops, hold on a sec, bad idea. Why am I getting so many labels? Because I've got two different charts in play. Let me just go to the circle chart. And for the circle chart, I just want to put that on label. There we go. And let me click label and say, allow labels to overlap. Um, and, oh man, this doesn't really look great. It's not quite in the right space, et cetera. Let me play around with this. Let me try to make this, um, um, Let's see, let me put it at the, the bottom and maybe right align it. Oh, you know, maybe center it and right. Oh, that looks pretty good. Oh, I like that one. But everything looks great, except this one over here, right? And you could spend forever going, oh, I want these all to be right aligned, but I want these to be left aligned. Well, there, uh, there are three ways to address it. My favorite is don't. The second is I could just, you know, kind of pad some data and, you know, have it go a little further, you know, change this so that then and maybe make this continuous and change the axis so it goes out further. Or I can tell you something that's been in Tableau forever and I didn't find out about it until um, Robert Roos was showing a dashboard he had made for the big book of dashboards. We, won't, we ended up including it. And myself, Andy Cockreave, Jeff Schaefer are all on this call. We have been using Tableau for a long time, and he does this. He just takes this, and he just moves it. And, and we had a WTF moment. What? When could you do that? So sometimes, you know, get some easy, easy wins in the tool. So that's a pretty cool way to create a gap chart. Um, let me show it with another example and what kind of confused some of the attendees um, uh, in, in my workshop and um, where they didn't think it was as clear. To, it wasn't as clear to them as it was clear to me. So um, here is um, a gap chart and showing the difference between 2017 and 2016. And they said they preferred the bar and the vertical line. Now, I have made this thing fancier where, oh, if the more recent year is bigger, make the connecting part. And by the way, a lot of people don't, you know, they'll make the connecting part. Oops, sorry about that. They'll make the connecting part, you know. Sorry, I'm just trying to get one of these items and not both. Choose the line chart, make the size of the line. Now it looks more like barbells or a dumbbell chart. Um, and I've made it so, hey, the 
the more recent year is larger, let me make that, um, make the line separating them green. Oh, here, the more recent year is less, so let, let me make the line separating them the color of the recent year. It still didn't work for them. So, well, let's see how we might, um, what, would, what might we do about this? So let me duplicate this. Let me just make it a line chart. So I'm, I'm about to show you how to create a comment chart. So, oh, let me build this thing. Let's, let me, let me kind of show you what's going on with it rather than uh, um, uh, uh, hitting this. So let me clear this. Let me go to, um, I know I'm going quickly on this, subcategory. Let me go with profit. Let me put year of order date on this. So let's see, do we have order date? We do. So I'm gonna create a different color for each year of order date. Okay, let me make this a circle chart. And I just wanna look at 2016 and 2017. So let me just keep only those, all right? Um, and you know, I'm just gonna put it on detail. And let me create a line chart. But I want to draw a line between 2016 and 2017. Okay, hold on a sec. What's going on here? So I just made a line chart. I'm only looking at 2016 and 2017. And let me, in addition to saying draw a line between these two things, let me also see how to change the size of it. So the earlier year, 2016, will be the tail and 2017 will be the head. So I'm gonna hold down the control key, drag this onto size, and you have got a comment chart. I can see where did I start, where did I end? Let me show you a pretty cool thing we can do. Let me put year on label. Ugh, that looks really stupid. Um, let me not let me hide all the mark labels. I can also do that over here, but I'll right click on this one and say mark label always show. Right click on this one and say mark label always show. And now I've kind of told you here's what the tail means, here's what the head means. The only other clue that might be really nice to have with this thing is I'd like the color to be different if profit increased and the color to be something else if the profit decreased. And this is where I go to my own websites, okay? So this is datarevelations.com, and I've got a whole discussion of um, what brought me here, why I think this thing is cool, um, how to make it, and coloring the comments. Some of these things I have on my fingertips, some of these things I don't. So I'm just gonna steal this right here, copy this. By the way, you can also make it that if you just want it to be, um, um, uh, not have a gradient color fill to it, but just solid colors, you can, there's a way to do that as well. And the workbook, where is it? It's right here. So if you wanna download this and see how this thing is made, in any case, uh, let me now create a new formula. So create calculated field. I will call it or the difference. Here we go. Look up. It is a table calculation that is essentially saying just look at profit for the current period and subtract profit from the previous period. You know, just let me put this on color, and uh, no, that's not quite right. And that's because it's table calculation, and I need to edit the table calculation so that I'm saying, I want it to you know, do this based on year of order date, compare the difference between 2016 and 2017, and by not selecting subcategory, it means when you get to the next subcategory, start this over and do this again. And you got a cool looking comet chart. 
not difficult to do. Um, I found this, um, so if we were ever to do a revised edition, second edition of the Big Book of Dashboards or volume two, I would absolutely include this. Um, in the workshops, I make sure people see it. It's compact. The other thing I have in it, in addition to making it really easy to see what's the previous period, what's now being able to compare along a common baseline, that's what humans do ridiculously well. Um, I've also got, if I wanted to um, have a vertical line that was a goal, am I ahead or behind the goal for the current year, I could easily put that in. So I think comet charts are a good addition. They also have a little benefit that they are aesthetically pleasing, but they're still kind of rock solid analytically. All right, um, one more. And that is, I want to show you how to do the, um, uh, the marginal histogram. Let me see what I've got here to make this happen relatively quickly. So um, the highlight table is my, um, uh, I call it the gateway drug to data visualization. You know, the people who just love their spreadsheets and I'll ask them to tell me, all right, have a look at this. Look at this data. Tell me what combination of region and subcategory is the most profitable and what's the least profitable. Um, and this is not so easy to find, but if I use a highlight table, boom, I can see it immediately. Oh, where's the dark blue? Oh, it's here and here. Where's the, um, the orange? So it gets people pretty excited about this stuff. But so I've kind of bought, gotten them to buy into the highlight table. So I've got one here and it's just based on, on sales. It's not a hard thing to construct. Um, but, you know, I'd like to stitch together you know, something that gives me the totals by subcategory and the totals by region. Now you're probably saying, well, can't you just do, you know, add the totals and say show row grand totals, show column grand totals. You can, but I don't have any color coding on these things. And if I did, because these numbers are so much bigger, I would lose all the color coding that's in here. So what I'd like to do is build a marginal histogram around this, like a bar chart that I'm gonna stick on the right side and a bar chart that I'm gonna either stick at the top or stick along the bottom. And here's how I would do it. Let me duplicate this sheet. And first of all, let me get rid of region and let me make some of sales. a bar chart, make it way narrower. Have to make sure the sorting is the same and things like that. Um, uh, maybe I'll put the label and left align it in here. And you know, I gotta tell you, uh, you know, I don't need the color coding because I can just see how big the numbers are. So maybe I'll take color off of here and I'll make the color a very light gray and maybe put a border around it, something like that. And I don't need to show the header. Well, let me, let me show you how these things get stitched together. What I've got here is, let me go to the, um, let me go to this sheet and just hiding and where is that and all i've done is i've kind of stitched together these two sheets put in a little extra space up at the top so the things line up properly and yeah, I could be, you know, go the extra mile. Um, let's see. Uh, da, 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 um, layout and padding. You know, maybe I don't need to have the left padding so much. Whoops, sorry. 
left padding on this one and change the right padding on this one and get these, you know, work to get these things to line up just perfectly. In any case, um, uh, you've got a scatter plot, you've got a um, highlight table. Um, I absolutely encourage you to go the extra mile, build the bar chart around these things. Uh, I do want to leave some time to some uh, Q&A, um, but a few other uh, just quick where the resources and where this stuff is. So the comet chart and how to make a marginal histogram, you can just go to datarevelations.com. I'll walk you through step by step how to do it. Um, I will send this workbook, warts and all, uh, to the incredible organizers of this tug who have been fantastic. And I'm sorry I can't make it out to Toronto in person. was looking forward to a great visit um, for uh, redistribution. So here's data revelations and uh, the workshop. The workshop is tool agnostic. It's, it's based on the big book of dashboards. It is not how to do stuff in Tableau. It, it pertains to Tableau, Click, Power BI, MicroStrategy, Excel. It's what you should be making and why you should be making it, not how do you actually make it. In any case, you can find it easily enough at Data Revelations. Here's the URL as well. But also use this promo code, TUG10, and you can get a 10% discount. And um, so I, I can see that there's been chat I can see that there is one, um, um, it, there is one open question in Q&A and then I'm happy to defer to the uh, uh, organizers what, what things have gone on in chat that maybe I should address. But um, copy and paste formatting, but does that work even if the charts are different? Um, you know, that's a really good question uh, from Tanvi. Um, I am not sure. There's a bunch, obviously, if you, you know, it, it's going to inherit certain characteristics. Oh, um, are there borders? What are, um, what's the alignment? What's the font being used, et cetera? So if I have a, a certain look to something that's just show, I go to another tab and it isn't anywhere close to what I want it to be, I will try, hey, will copy and pasting formatting uh, possibly get me uh, closer to um, where I would like it to be. And it may at least reduce um, uh, some of the efforts that are there. So, hey, thanks. I'm happy to entertain some questions, but it looks like you have, a, you know, uh, the, the um, winners of the data visualization uh, contest, and I don't want to step on that. So happy to defer to Candice and others uh, and answer questions if you would like me to. Hey Steve, we do have um, a question that was on the chat, and uh, it was about how you move the uh, the values, the text marks. And it said, "Will the values go back to the old location if the um, chart values change in, in the gap chart?" So do they? Oh, will will back? they go? Will they go back to the old values if I were to change it? Well, let's see if we can find out. I, that's a good question. Is that like a one-off, and the next time you do it, you're going to be really annoyed with yourself for having done that and think, wow, that's totally messed up. Hold on, let's see if we can get a filter or something like that in there. Uh, we probably can. I like this. So I don't know the answer and I wanna know, uh, have I messed myself up? So let me do this, let me go into filters, uh, select from list and let me get rid of some of the people that are in here. Okay, let's watch this carefully, folks. You know what, let me, and I'm, I'm, I'm getting rid of a bunch of things and hopefully, so there, it, it, there was definitely, you know, a, you know, the mark is not the same, stuff has moved. Um, uh, so I think it knows, it's the label associated with this mark. So this mark is going to move and the label looks like it's gonna be going with it. Cool question, I can't say for sure um, if it is going to, um, stick with you uh, or not. And, and look, there's a part of me, you know, that's going, my spidey sense is saying, anytime you do something manually, you're probably going to get, you know, 
uh, get punished for it in the years down the road for not coming up with a more systemized version of it, but it will get you out of a quick bind. So I think you'll be okay. Uh, I think there's another question too about uh, side by side, if you can sync the scroll. Oh, was I not sharing the screen while I was doing this? Yeah, I wasn't. Hold on. Um, just want you to see that. So here I am saying, hey, and look at this. I'm changing stuff. Apply. And everything's working cool. So sorry about that. Oh, the other thing was side by side. And if these things go really long and synchronizing the scrolling. Funny you should ask that. Hold on. Let me share my screen. As a while back, I came up with a, oh my God, this is just a brain dead simple way to have uh, synchronized scrolling. So, simple synchronized scrolling. Okay, um, I'll walk you through how it's made. Let me show it to you in action. It says click me. Okay. I've only got one category here. Let me add another. Let me add another. Let me keep going. The, the, the key is not to have any of the individual sheets scrolling but to just have the scroll over here on the right. So yeah, you may have a, um, uh, something which is longer than it needs to be, and I've never had the case where it needs to be anywhere this long, but you're essentially making a dashboard which is much larger and just rely on your browser to do the scrolling for you. So you never have to worry about the sheet and this other sheet scrolling. It works great and it's super easy. Uh, Anuj, you're asking about comma charts with lie connections, and if you're connected with over 50 million records, um, since it involves computation and calculation, the only thing that requires the computation calculation is the coloring of the things, because I'm using a table calculation. Um, so, um, I'd, I would say try it and see if it's going to be a problem or not. And of course, I'm going to say, well, if there's, well, if you're dealing with live data, you're dealing with live data. Maybe something like Exasol will do the trick. Okay, anything else? I think there's one more there, Steve. I want to show top five items by subcategory. Um, in, in the context of what? Just, I guess that would be just a top five. Uh, yeah, it would just be a top, you know, that that five. one's pretty easy um, uh, to, as, as you know, the, a top N filter is a pretty easy thing to do um, and has been kind of like out of the box functionality. So um, the, the, just do a quick Google search on how I do top five by subcategory. Then you'll have someone saying, well, here, how can I toggle between, how can I make it top N? How can I make it top N and bottom N? that type of thing. Uh, how can I compare the top five for just this region with the top five overall? Then you start getting into funky stuff because um, um, uh, you're, you're applying, in one case, you're applying a filter for region. And gosh, this community, and, and by the way, I don't know the quick answer to that last harder question. And I would just Google it because someone in the community has written some you know, remarkably great step-by-step -step instruction on how to do it. So you'll, you'll get your answer, you'll find it, and it's uh, super simple. It's super simple to just do top five. The top five for the East region for the first, the top five overall, a little more complicated, somebody solved it for you. All right, well, I hope to see some people at the workshop on the 7th and the 9th, and um, hope to see some people in person uh, at some live event in the not too distant future. Thank you all so much for having me here today. It's been a blast.
Thank you, Steve. Uh, definitely really value your um, awesome uh, insight and uh, your experience in, um, and <clears throat> you, you make it look so easy. So uh, it's uh, definitely great for you to come and present to us. And uh, we all learned a few new things or a lot of new things maybe. <laughs> well, but well, there's look, a couple of things there that I were like, whoa. <laughs> look, you know, the, the um, lately. Think about this for a second, the copying and pasting formatting, that's been in the product for like eight years. And the number of people who've been using the product for almost that long that didn't know it existed. Same with moving the mark. Yeah. You have, exactly. you have you know, I've been using the product for 10 years and didn't know that that was there. So I'm constantly learning new stuff. I, I you know, uh, and, and also there are people who undoubtedly knew a bunch of these things that I showed, but hopefully there was a couple things for everybody. So don't feel bad if you don't know this stuff. I'm constantly learning new stuff about the product. That's the great thing about the Tableau community and uh, sharing and collaborating with people, right? 100% awesome. agree. <laughs> Thank you very much, Steve. Uh, and now I'll hand it over to Vinitha to introduce the um, next speakers. Great, thanks, thanks Candice. Um, first, I hope everyone's staying, uh, staying safe and healthy um, and glad uh, you're all here. So thank you for uh, joining the uh, Toronto Tug. Uh, one of the things that we had talked about when we started organizing this Tug last fall um, with my uh, colleagues, uh, Candice, uh, Catherine and o Ojo, um, was we wanted to make sure we had you know, some really good speakers, world-class speakers such as Steve, but we also want to promote Tableau in the community uh, because this Tug is all about you. It's all about sharing. Um, and to that extent, we want to make sure that you have the opportunity to present. So if anyone is interested in, in presenting at a future Tug, please reach out to us. Last, uh, last Tug, we had Daria present, which was amazing. And uh, this time, I'm going to introduce you to three talented young men who um, participated in the Data Biz Art Challenge. And that has been running for three years in a row. It's a partnership um, where university students can compete. Uh, it's a partnership with uh, Tableau, Deloitte, and CIBC. And uh, essentially, they are given data sets and are asked to um, use Tableau and come up with a story. In many of the cases, some of the students had never even heard about Tableau and really came together to put together some amazing visuals. Um, so this year, I'd like to introduce you to the winners uh, of the Data Biz Art Challenge. Um, so first is, is Ryan. He's uh, a final year at Wilfrid Laurier. He's also featured on Tableau Public. So if you do go to Tableau Public and look up Ryan, you'll see some of his amazing visuals. Uh, he's been using Tableau for a couple of years. He even got called out uh, in a tweet by Mark, uh, the CEO of Salesforce, for some uh, visuals that he had done. So great work. Uh, next is Paul, who, who is in his final year of uh, BBA in computer uh, comp science at the Wilfrid Lurie Waterloo and University of Waterloo. Uh, he's been using Tableau for about a year. And uh, Christopher as well, uh, I think you're in the same program and you've also been using Tableau for about a, for about a year now. Um, amazing that you both, all three of you came together, participated in this competition, and we're really looking forward to seeing uh, your, your winning visuals. So I'll hand it over to you and uh, thanks for joining us today. Uh, you can okay there we go yeah. Perfect. right thanks Vanita, for that uh introduction um my name is ryan as you mentioned joined by my two teammates chris and paul we're very happy to speak to you all today and to present our visualization we created for the final round of the data biz art student challenge so before we get into the biz uh i'll, I'll just take you through our approach to the case and how we ultimately arrived at our idea or our uh, topic for the biz, which is the water cycle. So the topic we were given for the final round of this competition was climate change. And we were given a whole lot of data uh, related to it. And it was really uh, from a wide variety um, of topics. So we had things like emissions, a lot of socioeconomic data, habitat biodiversity, national parks, natural resources, um, lakes, rivers, glaciers, so really a wide ra range of things. 
And we had to create a biz only using that data, no outside data uh, was allowed. And we were given about a month uh, to, to do this. Our initial approach was to figure out what we were working with. So uh, we had a lot of data, so we divided those data sets up among ourselves and we each took a few of them and tried to find some insights we could draw. Um, we later came together and we found that a common theme loosely uh, between all of our ideas was water and sort of the effects uh, of water on climate change. Um, with that, we did a bit more of our own background research, dug a bit deeper into that, that theme. Um, and that's how this developed into the water cycle. And we found that a lot of the effects of climate change that we will feel uh, are due to directly due to changes um, in the water cycle. So that formed the basis of our biz where we go through uh, the specific stages of the water cycle, how they're being affected or changed due to climate change and ultimately what that uh, impact, what the impacts will look like for us. So we also wanted to note that climate change is affecting the entire water cycle. And with the data we were given, we could only really comment on uh, a few of those stages. So it's worth knowing that there are uh, stages of the water cycle that are being affected by climate change that we don't mention, but they're still just as important as the ones that we do talk about. So with that, I'll hand it off to Paul and he'll take you through the first part of our biz. So to start off our story, here's just an interesting fact for everybody. Um, among the most serious earth and science environmental policy issues confronting society are the potential changes in the Earth's water cycle due to climate change. And we all live in a society where water, water is plentiful being in Canada, and we often take, in, take for granted how much we rely on it. But now is kind of the time to take notice because over the past century, we have been rapidly warming up the Earth, with 19 of the last 20 years being the warmest on a global scale. And as we take a look at the average temperature departure data, Canada is no exception, with the country never going below zero temperature departure since the year 2000. So in the last almost 20 years, we have never been below average warmth. And this ends up affecting the evaporation stage in the water cycle, as the warmer air is able to hold more moisture, taking additional water from lakes and rivers, which will have a downstream impact on agriculture and drinking water supply. And from there, we move on to transpiration, a lesser known but nevertheless important part of the water cycle. Transpiration, for those of you who haven't heard of it yet, is the process of water movement through a plant, specifically its evaporation through the plant's leaves. Through the process of transpiration, plants extract energy from the air around them, resulting in a cooling effect. But due to human dependence on trees for everyday products, such as paper, furniture, and even chewing gum, deforestation is a real issue in today's world. Canada has lost percentage-wise about 5.2% of its tree cover extent since 2010, which is actually relatively low compared to most countries around the world. As you can see from the data, Saskatchewan had the highest overall loss in 2015, using 3.4% in that year alone. But large-scale deforestation in tropical areas such as the Amazon have shown the effects of losing cooling from transpiration. And now I'm going to hand it over to Chris to go through some of the other parts of the water cycle. Thanks, Paul. Um, now, as we take a look at the all water that's being evaporated, this will lead to an increase in precipitation disasters, as what goes up must eventually come back down. Uh, this bar graph down here highlights the frequency of these different events over the past century. Hurricanes are highlighted in yellow, severe thunderstorms in gray, and winter storms in red. As you can see, over the past 25 years, the frequency of these severe thunderstorms has increased, with 2008 being a very notable year. Now, when rain falls down to the ground, infiltration can be a big factor in reducing the risk of catastrophic flooding. Infiltration refers to the land's ability to absorb water. And as a result, areas with more dense urban development impacts that ability, resulting in more runoff and naturally stronger flood. If we compare the graph on floods to that of precipitation, we can see the strong correlation between the two. And once again, we see that over the past 30 years or so, floods are happening much more frequently than they used to. 
Now, the next thing we did was we took a look at sea ice and glaciers in northern Canada. We compared the areas of ice mass over the past 50 years and noticed the steady downward trend there. Rising temperatures have accelerated uh, the rate at which they melt, and this is going to lead to rising sea levels. Now, even if we only consider a one meter sea level increase, this can have an unprecedented impact on low-lying countries, especially if they're developing. We visualize this impact by focusing on a couple different aspects that can be affected. Agriculture, GDP, land, population, more. If we take a look at a three meter increase, we can see that these following countries will become severely impacted. Now I'll pass it off to Ryan to explore this impact a little bit more. So these developing nations, uh, along with some of the smaller countries uh, in the world, who have less infrastructure and less resources, these are the ones that will be the hardest hit by climate change. But if we compare that to their emissions, that's where we see that there's sort of an imbalance. Um, the ND gain index is a measure for a country's vulnerability and also their preparation for the effects of climate change. Uh, combining that with the emissions of different countries, we see that larger countries such as China, uh, the United States, Russia, uh, these are countries who are well prepared for climate change and they have some of the highest emissions in the world. Um, on the other end of the spectrum, we see some of the African countries, also a few Middle Eastern countries. Um, these countries are the most vulnerable to climate change. Um, but they also have some of the lowest emissions. So that's the imbalance where the burden of climate change will lie with uh, the countries who um, don't contribute that much to the overall problem when uh, we look at their emissions. So there is some, there has been some collective action taken uh, to change this through the Paris Agreement, uh, which was signed in 2016 uh, by 195 nations and it aims to control uh, the rise of global temperatures by uh, managing emissions. So there is a commitment to action from uh, almost every country in the world, but we think that it's very important that climate policy action is taken by the largest uh, emitting nations, such as the, uh, China, the United States, and India. Uh, these countries account for over half of the world's uh, carbon dioxide emissions combined. Um, looking more closely at these specific scenarios, we see that if climate policy action is implemented uh, that's consistent with the Paris Agreement, emissions do fall in almost in uh, each of these two scenarios. Emissions uh, are on a downward trend over the next uh, about 80 years up, up until 2100. Um, but as we know, scenarios aren't uh, consistent with reality. Uh, the United States pulled out of the Paris Agreement officially at the end of last year. And looking at these two scenarios under no policy and even low policy, emissions don't fall until about 80 years from now. So that's something to keep an eye on in the future when it comes to policy, climate policy action uh, in the United States. China and India, on the other hand, they are on their way to achieving uh, their climate or to achieving their emissions targets. But of course, more can always be done to overachieve uh, and do a bit more when it comes to reducing emissions. So in conclusion, um, the effects of climate change that we are feeling and will feel even more in the future are directly due, many of them are directly due to, to changes in the water cycle. Um, but the underlying factor in all of this will always be emissions. Emissions don't have borders and that's why it's it's very important that individual nations take responsibility. Um, but it's even more important that there's climate action taken by the largest nations in the world for us to see any real progress in our fight against climate change. Uh, that's our presentation and now we'll go into any questions if there are any. Hey, we have an excellent question here. It's with the presence of COVID-19, how has it impacted the effects of climate change in countries around the world? Um, that's a good question. I mean, we, 
made this visualization back in March, so uh, we didn't really include anything about that in here. But I know just from what I've seen, at least with emissions, um, in a lot of large countries, there's been a, uh, obviously less people driving, less cars on the road, and there's been you know substantial declines in in um, emissions in in these large cities. Uh, so on that uh, topic, specifically emissions, there have been reductions. Um, beyond that, I don't think we've, we've looked into that. Uh, uh, Ryan, um, or Paul or Chris, um, what version of Tableau did you make this in? So this would have, I think it was 2020.1. I think that was the latest in March. And uh, what uh, what do the um, I buttons do? Do they provide more context to the uh, the metrics that you're using, or? Right. Yeah. So we put these in here just to sort okay. of provide definitions for maybe terms or you know measures that are, are that people might not know about. So at the end of gain, we have a tooltip in there just to describe it. Okay. That's a, is that a hidden um, container or? I oh, know it's just as a tooltip on top oh, of this. Okay. Um, yeah, it's, it's on top of the shape. Uh, there's a tooltip there. Oh, awesome. Okay, cool. Thanks. This is uh, really great, and uh, it, it's amazing that you know you came together and just uh, pulled pulled this off. Any advice you would like to give to folks that are just learning Tableau? Uh, well, I know from my experience, at least I started off participating in Makeover Monday. A lot of the the community challenges that that gets you more comfortable using it and um, more com comfortable with the data visualization in general um, but beyond that I'd say try to at least if this work for me visualizing data on, on topics and, and themes that, that you're generally interested in genuinely interested in um, that makes you you know gets you more enthusiastic about the topic and uh, get you more interested in, in analyzing the data. Um, so that, that's what worked for me, but I, I would say participating in those uh, community, uh, community driven events and then regular challenges, that's what, uh, that's the best advice I can give, I would say. Ryan, um, um, this is, is available for public viewing, right? Yeah, so it's on my Tableau public page. Um, if you go on there, uh, and then um, what resources would you recommend in your search for generating this type of viz? Um, I'm not hundred percent percent sure what is meant by in a search. Um, if we're talking about the data, it was all provided for us. Um, any extra research we did was, was typically just from, you know, re reputable uh, climate, climate change sort, uh, agencies or things that, or, you know, organizations like that. Um, but yeah, if, it's, if that question is relating to the data, everything was provided to us already. And what was the volume of data um, that was provided to you? Did you have to do any data preparation? And what was the dashboard layout size that you used? So in terms of volume, um, there were, pro I would say there were probably maybe 20 to 25 different data sets that were given all in Excel. A lot of them were you know, on, on a smaller scale, um, just just tables. And I think the source of a lot of it was Government of Canada website. Um, so there, there there was a lot of different uh, data sets provided. They were all relatively clean. There wasn't a lot of uh, data prep that we needed to do. The layout of this dashboard, um, I'm not 100% sure, I don't, don't remember exactly, but uh, it's just long form, so it must, I think it's about 8,000, 7,000, 8,000 pixels long. Um, but yeah, 
I can confirm that for sure if you really want to know. All right, we have another great question here. How did you divide the work to deliver the final results in a single workbook? And did you experience in any challenges with this? Uh, right, so we had a month to do this and we probably spent half to maybe just over half of that time trying to come up with an idea and a story that works. Um, in terms of actually developing the dashboard uh, we left that probably to the last uh, week to week and a half. Um, it was all done on one computer. So that, that was the easiest way that we figured to do it instead of having to, you know, pass the dashboard around. Um, so we did it all together in, in, in one computer. Um, in terms of challenges, uh, we were all fairly comfortable with, with visualizing this and then using Tableau. So um, the biggest challenge was definitely coming up with a unique perspective and a unique story to, to tell uh, with this topic on climate change. And uh, then we have one other question. Were any calculations within Tableau required to create um, the viz of your policy comparison charts or were all of the data points provided um, for you ready to plot? Yeah, so for that data, it was all provided. So yeah, it, it was basically broken down by, by country. Um, there were a lot more countries than just those three, but uh, yeah, broken down by country and then the different policies and projected emissions in each of those years. Those are all of the questions that I have. Great. Awesome. Thanks. Uh, thank you so much for coming to present. Um, and uh, for showing us your viz. Uh, great job, guys, on the visualization. It looks really good. Thanks. Uh, really good topic. Uh, you know, and you added some context to it as well, I assume, with the, you know, like when U.S. withdrew from the Paris Agreement and such. Uh, okay, there's one, there's a couple more questions. Uh, I think Kai asked how many years of Tableau experience you had before the Viz challenge? Uh, for me in particular, um, about two. Uh, Chris and I participated in this challenge last year and we, we came in second place. So we already had, uh, we gained some experience through that. Um, but I don't know if Chris and Paul, you guys want to, want to answer that? Uh, for me, it was uh, relatively new. Uh, I've only used Tableau maybe once or twice before. Uh, but uh, I've always been into displaying data and finding insights from data. So I thought it would be a really interesting to do thing to do. And uh, um, yeah, I, overall, it was a really interesting experience. And I'd definitely be down to do it again sometime in the future. Awesome. Chris, did you have any further comments or? Uh, yeah, no, it's just as Ryan said, I, I first used it like last, last year's competition. And um, yeah, so like around a year of experience, I guess. Okay, and there is one more question too. Sorry, before I wrap up, were there any questions that you couldn't answer because of data governance or limitations in the data sources? Um. Well, we, I, I did mention, obviously we wanted, we would have wanted to expand on some stages of the water cycle that aren't present in this viz. Like, I think a topic that came up when we were brainstorming was it was human, uh, you know, interaction or human interruption in the water cycle. That, that was something that, that we wanted to include and we tried to include, but the data ne never really supported it to the extent that uh, we would have liked. So, yeah, I didn't mention that before in terms of including specific stages of the water cycle. Uh, the data only supported so many of them. So that was one of the limitations. But in terms of the, of the data itself, 
um, yeah, there, there weren't really any, uh, you know, governance issues or anything like that. Everything was, was provided and ready to be used. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for coming and presenting your visualization. At, like, always love to see how other people uh, think of things and how they visualize things. And uh, congratulations on your win. Yeah. Uh, Good job, guys. Thanks very much for, for inviting us here. And uh, thanks, everyone, for attending. Awesome. So I just, uh, just to close out tonight, uh, I just have a few slides uh, to present um, uh, that Catherine did up some slides for me, which I forgot to, I just started talking. I didn't uh, bring the slides up. So anyways, uh, so, um, so I'll just uh, go through and make sure. Yeah, so this is just uh, to refresh everybody's memories. Uh, this is uh, your Toronto Tug team. So if you have any questions about the TUG or if you're interested in presenting in the future or um, hosting a TUG, be sure to reach out to one of us. Um, uh, and then of course, this is our mission. So uh, we're gonna break for the summer now for July and August. Uh, we'll be back in September. Uh, and because there is um, the, the conference this year is virtual, uh, we'll be looking at uh, adding to that, whatever Tableau does, we'll be sort of uh, looking at organizing some events around that. Uh, so great things uh, to look forward to uh, for the fall. Um, hopefully we'll be able to meet in person by then, but uh, if not, then uh, we'll be using uh, Zoom or another awesome, uh, you know, thanks to Tableau for providing us this awesome tool tonight so that we can all uh, get together and compare notes and uh, learn some stuff. Uh, so that's obviously our agenda, and this is Steve, and this is the student challenges. Uh, yeah, so just thank you to everybody for coming. And I think we have a survey here. So if anybody would, uh, if, if you guys could fill out the survey and give us your feedback and let us know how we're doing and what you would like to see, that would be great. Does uh, yeah. So I'll just leave that up.